global producers, distributors, and rights holders, why are you waiting for license fee payments from your productions, both new and back catalogue? Pipe buys your entertainment receivables and turns it into upfront capital immediately. Pipe can help you pull forward up to five years worth of contracted license fees from all the major streamers and broadcasters. So you can use the capital to produce more, acquire more, finance more, and grow your business on your own terms. Sign up today at pipe.com slash entertainment. That's pipe.com slash entertainment. And start fast forwarding your receivables now. Telecast, the TV industry news review. With just a few days to go to the first Telecast Content Funding Festival, I'm previewing the event in conversation with Katie West, Head of Content for Apex Content Ventures, Phil McKenzie, CEO of Financier Goldfinch, Garrett Kemming from Quintus Studios, and Rob McRae, Managing Director at New World Film Finance. We're talking about the panels they're appearing on and who they're looking to meet at the event. It's all coming up on this week's Telecast. My first guest on this week's Telecast Content Funding Festival preview show is Phil McKenzie, COO of Goldfinch and a panellist on the NFT and blockchain panel at next week's event. Welcome to Telecast, Phil. How are you doing? Hey, Justin. Yeah, really well. Thank you for having me on. Absolute pleasure. It's great to chat with you ahead of next week's event. First of all, tell us about Goldfinch. What do you do and how are you involved in this whole area of not only media, but NFTs and blockchain? We were set up by uh, Kirsty, our CEO, and my business partner uh, just over eight years ago as, as a funding entity, as a financier focused on the independent entertainment sector. Back in the day, you know, EIS and SEIS schemes to raise funds and deploy them into, into indie projects. As the years progressed and it became increasingly difficult and to, to use EIS and SEIS, we, you know, just you know, used our network and contacts to raise funds from other investors and contacts of ours. And we have a number of facilities and relationships with institutions where we're deploying funds for them into the space. Uh, And so over the years, we've raised and deployed over 200 million into over 300 projects now. And the vast majority of that is film. There's a chunk of TV in there as well and a very small amount of video games too. And, And over the years, we've uh, being attached to stuff as you know, exact producers, co-producers, as as you are, if you're sort of holding the the purse strings. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've really, you know, doubled down on our production side of what we do and developing our own slate of IP and projects in house. And that's ended up being focused on documentaries uh, and genre films under around about the 2 million budget mark and other stuff that we can jump in as co-producers that maybe might be a bit bigger budget, sort of five to 10 range, bigger bits of IP, bigger filmmakers involved, where it makes sense to sort of share the, share the load with, with another more, another experienced producer. And then we also have a group of companies that we put under the banner of ventures. So we have finance production and then ventures and ventures are individuals or businesses in in the entertainment and media space that we have put a bit of money behind or a bit of strategic support um and you know that the ultimately we are excited about what they're doing and we see a way for them to plug into the other bits of goldfinch the finance and production side so we've got a whole range of fantastic businesses there and people that we're in partnership with and that kind of leads me on to like how did we get into in, 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 into the nft crypto space and that was through a business within that ventures portfolio called First Flight that we set up with a, a guy called Nick Sadler, who runs that. And that, for the last couple of years, has built this fantastic, essentially, community of emerging filmmakers. It's, a, it's an incubator for first, second time filmmakers. And we run a quarterly film fund there. We do, you know, regular kind of educational webinars. And, you know, we, we build a really, a really fantastic, you know, highly engaged, really responsive, you know, group of excited young creatives. And when there was a lot of noise, probably a year and a half ago around NFTs beginning to pop, and we started to think maybe this could maybe this could be the sort of practical use of blockchain tokens, et cetera that gets sort of mass adoption and, and and people start to understand and see the real value 
of, of the underlying tech. We were thinking, well, how can we put this into our business and, and, and how can we sort of start getting our hands dirty and understanding what, what's possible? And I started talking to Nick about this, where we've been thinking, how could we raise funds for young filmmakers? Because it's the most difficult piece to do, really, is, 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 is both a, a young, un, unproven filmmaker and also for a first-time feature or that first money in. And so we kind of came up with this idea of you could use NFTs to do that and kind of fast forward to today where we created a platform called FF3, which is essentially a, a crypto crowdfunding platform. So think of Kickstarter on steroids is the easiest way to describe it, where you bring your crypto onto the platform, you swap your crypto for tokens in a project. And those tokens, depending on how many you, 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 you buy, give you access to tiers of rewards. And within those tiers of rewards are NFTs, access to Discord channels, uh, access to content before public release or, or content that the public wouldn't see, credits, and all the usual other kind of rewards that go with, with a crowdfunding campaign and, and, and project. And we completed our first successful raise at the start of the year. And since then, we've been you know, adapting the technology, building the community, and finding the next few projects to put on there, as well as, you know, talking to a lot of investors about, you know, kind of putting a bit more seed capital and growth capital into the business. And then just by starting that whole ball rolling with FF3, there's an amazing amount of opportunities in the space that are kind of, you know, coming to us now and and that, that, we're, that we're looking at. How can we help people in the Web3 space, in the Film3 space, you know, use a bit of our knowledge from traditional entertainment sector to, to better position their projects and and get their projects off the ground. And then also on the other side, how can we help the traditional entertainment industry begin to access all this amazing technology and opportunity that is that, that that's there in Web3? So we're kind of in this really interesting space in bridging that gap, being the conduit between the two now, which is super exciting and if not very, very overwhelming with the amount of, 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 of plates we're trying to spin and, and opportunities and people we're speaking to. It's certainly an exploding area and and one that we were really keen to to explore at the event next week. I've got a couple of questions. I mean, first of all, when it comes to TV, you've said that you've been involved with film quite a little bit and you've done bits of TV and obviously, you know, uh, in the content industry, what, whatever TV means anymore when we're talking about uh, new technology projects. But are TV a traditional, more traditional TV or shorter form piece of content or serialized content? And you say you're working in documentaries. Is that an area that you're really looking to move into when it comes to your FF3 crowdfunding platform? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's it's any content really that has, you know, a clear marketing hook and a clear audience and community either attached or that can be attached to it, and that we can we can get out there and market it to. That's what we're looking for. And I think the fantastic thing is now that because of all these different distribution platforms, all these different funding options, not just in the Web three world but outside of it, you know, it doesn't matter what format it's in now it's it, 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 the great ip is great ip and then depending on the buyer and the, the platform you'll sort of you know chop it up and work out what that format looks like i keep reading probably incorrectly but who knows everybody i mean lots of people are telling me you know the metaverse isn't here and then i keep feeling that you know i'm missing out and i'm really late to the game but i've got one question specific question about nfts i keep reading that they're over already are they is that what you you know is that what you uh, your take on it no not, not 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 at all not at all i mean it's we're still in the very first phase of i, I don't know whether i'd call it early adoption but i mean it's it, it, it's in that first wave of people starting to use the technology bigger brands companies businesses investors coming into the space and and it evolving, you know, with with their input, but it's it's still very early stages, and I think we've seen maybe that first wave of ideas, projects, products come out, but we're still very early stage, and you know, you, you just got to look at the metaverse and see, and in its current state, it's still quite clunky. It's still not an amazing experience. You know, it still feels very. 2D and not too experiential with a little bit of imagination you can see where that's going to go and I kind of feel that's the same with with NFTs and with tokens you know for the last year we've seen a lot of quite basic uses of what's possible there and now we're starting to see some really interesting 
you know, ev- evolutions of what is possible using this amazing tech. And I think we'll continue to do so. But I wouldn't think there's, you know, th- th- that views may be kind of pushed a little bit by, you know, everyone's seen a lot of people, a lot of press around people making a lot of money in in, 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 in buying NFTs, flipping NFTs. Yes, that has happened and that will slow a little bit. Like I keep saying, there's a long, long, you know, future ahead. We're just coming out of that first stage of seeing what is actually possible. Yeah. And I suppose it's, it's the development as what an NFT is rather than it just being a, a sort of almost a a digital piece of artwork, I think, or a, or a tweet, for example, that's yeah. uh, been sold and then resold. And, you know, I've also been reading about, you know, the other opportunities that NFTs give you in terms of access and in terms of longer commitments and closer relationships with a producer, for example. So that's perhaps where things are going is, is the, the value proposition of an NFT is going to develop over time once creatives actually start to start to play with them a bit exactly and that's that first wave was great we can make these nfts and it's digital art and that's fantastic and it's, you know it's on the blockchain and there's smart contracts attached and as a creator you can see you know a trail of revenue coming back for any reselling of it but what we're now seeing is a kind of switch to you know what's the utility and this kind of word comes up a lot in the web3 space what's the utility attached to these nfts and these tokens that are being created like that there needs to be something long lasting and meaningful and valuable to the people buying into them and using them so yeah great if you've created a a a, a poster an nft of the the artwork and the poster that you've created for your project but like what am i actually getting out of that that's really valuable is it access to something that i couldn't before is it access to something that people other people don't get is it a share of revenues coming back is it like all these other things that and, and that's a great example of of that change from that initial kind of you know, rush into the space of that very kind of simplistic approach to, to now how it's evolving now to saying, wow, we can do all these other things with this tech, apart from just, you know, it's cool that we can timestamp an NFT on the blockchain and, and make sure that we're being transparent and how people are being paid. Actually, there's more opportunity out there and possibilities out there attached to the tech. When it comes to next week's event and producers that are going to be attending and other executives as well, but producers, content producers specifically, who are you looking to meet up with and and to connect with? And what sort of producer would you really like to have a conversation with? We're always open to a conversation with, with, with any content creator, producer, filmmaker, you know, director, writer, anything. We're always keen on always having an open door policy in terms of projects and people that we meet and talk to because you just don't know where it can go or how we can add the value and with all the different bits to the business there's always something we can kind of offer or uh, you know or, or feedback we can put in but in terms of what's kind of top priority for us it's it's filmmakers with great great ip and or you know concept stories that have you know, a clear sort of route to market and an audience attached or community, you know, that that, that, that already exists around it or, or could exist around it. You know, that goes for the sort of production side and the, the, the maybe the FF3 side of what we do. But on the finance side, it's a bit more transactional in terms of, you know, what's in place financially and in, in, currently on your project. What do you need from us? And how can we get comfortable around the security that we're taking for the finance we're putting in? So, so yeah, I'd, I'd say it's those kind of two pools of, of, of projects and producers we're looking to talk to, really. But, but as I said, always open to, to, to meeting and chatting and, 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 and offering our sort of take on, on, on projects. Fantastic. Well, that's, that's great. I'm really looking forward to your discussion alongside Umair Masoom from M Content. And that's going to be moderated by Sam Barcroft from uh, Creatorville. So uh, delving in in a little bit more detail next week and really making sense of the metaverse, blockchain, NFTs, and really sort of starting to to see what the opportunities are for producers. Phil, thank you so much for your time. I'll see you next Tuesday. Great. Thanks, Tristan. Cheers. Have a good day. My next guest on this week's Telecast Content Funding Festival preview show is katie west head of content for apex content ventures welcome to the show katie 
Hello, how are you, Justin? I'm really well. Good. Looking forward to next week. I hope you are, because obviously you're part of the event, one of our sponsors, but also taking part in the uh, brand-funded programming panel. So thank you for that. Before we talk about brand-funded programming, mm-hmm. it's actually been one of the most successful or, or mo- one of the most popular subjects, I would say, on telecast. The, the shows that we've run on this subject in the past have consistently been some of the highest, most successful, most listened to shows. Tell us about Apex Content Ventures. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And, I, and, and likewise, really looking forward to panel next week and hearing loads of stuff about how how different productions get funded but just a little bit about apex content ventures we are a separate trading entity which is part of the publicist group publicist group is a global group of agencies who work across both creative and media agencies and they represent a whole host of different clients in the market about their best advertising practice What we do in Apex Content Ventures is we use investment from the group, so drawn down from our head office in Paris, and we put this into um, investment into TV programming, which supports um, broadcasters uh, in their advertising space. So what we're doing is we're helping making investments really early into programming without having to wait for um, the broadcasters having to wait for advertising spend. So, um, and we do this... quite significant scale. So the, what it means is that the broadcasters have investment from us, from Apex Content Ventures, really early on in the year when they're thinking about their commissioning. And they can make decisions having that investment early about what programming they want to make and what's best for them. And we, we do that because we want to support their advertising um, environment and make sure that they can supply the best programming, which brings, brings in the best audiences And hence, we'll draw in, you know, space for us to create advertising um, inventory from them. Okay. And obviously, Publis is a massive group, one of the biggest advertising groups in the world. Tell us about your your previous projects then. It sounds like, you know, uh, like you say, you're working at a a fairly decent scale of of project. Can you give us a few examples of projects that you've worked on and how they've developed? We've been going for about five years in total. And across the course of that time, we've invested in literally hundreds of hours of different programming. And that programming is everything from drama, scripted, entertainment, comedy, you know, reality, everything. So we're very much in the space of all various different types of programming. However, we we can't disclose entirely everything that we invest in. However, we do have some programs that um, we've done recently that um, that we can we can mention. So, for example, some of the things on Channel Four that we've invested in, which have been on, uh, I think this year or last year, was Home with Jack Thorne drama with Jodie Comer and Stephen Graham, Deceit, which was um, drama about the Wimbledon honey trap for the woman who was murdered in, in Wimbledon Common, Close to Me, which is another drama with Connie Nielsen and Christopher Eccleston, and also another different show which was called class of 2020 which was a, a sort of reality program looking at all the kids at school during and during pandemic year so um, a whole host of different programming that we've invested in and um, that's just some of the things that that we can touch upon that we've done projects with that's a really wide range of content there so obviously home was was a, a pretty high profile drama yeah you know how does the decision making mm-hmm. process work when it comes to what you're investing in at, at apex content ventures yeah, it's a good question. We get asked this quite a lot. What we're there to do is we are there to support the broadcasters make their decisions. So they will ultimately decide which programming suits them and what's the best for their programming. The commissioning process is, is, is theirs. So they will always make, be making the decisions about where their mo- that the money should be invested. What happens is they will let us know which programs uh, are available And then we'll have a discussion with them. And then we make an agreement about which programs we make the investment into. After that, we will have a discussion with the producers. So we we, we love to chat to producers about um, our involvement, how we work with them, which is very light touch, really. All of our agreement is with the broadcasters or our contract is with the broadcasters. So, um, and we don't take any rights off the producers at all. So the only thing we will do is have a credit on the show to say that we've invested in the programme. So we love to chat to the producers 
after we've made it, uh, the broadcasters have made a decision about which programs or we've decided which programs together, which we'll invest in. And then we will have a chat with the, the producers and sort of discuss how um, Apex has been involved and uh, our position with them. So it's a really great relationship we have with producers in general. Right. Well, that's, that's quite different, isn't it? Because usually you're looking at investment. The investment discussion is happening directly with the rights holder and the actual producer themselves but actually your relationship is with the commercial broadcaster and it's sort of the other way around that's exactly it yeah so we do often have producers who come to us to ask directly for investments we're always looking at new ways to invest and new ways to do things so we really like having these discussions with with producers to see if they're new ways of working however the the way that we that we generally work is that our, our relationship is with the broadcasters first because we need them to make the decision about what they want to commission and we don't in, we don't sway them so we might book sometimes we have projects that for example might have worked in the UK and we might speak to a, a, a broadcaster in another territory like for example the US or vice versa where we have a relationship um, and we've worked on a project together and um, we might sort of try and make introductions in, in different territories. So we can do that kind of work too, to help producers bring their ideas to, to different territories, for example. That's going to be really interesting for a lot of the attendees, the delegates that are coming along to next week's event, because I know looking at the delegate list, we've got drama producers, fairly major drama producers from across Europe, actually, as well as unscripted producers as well. And we'll talk about the panel in a second, but when it comes to relationship building and networking, what have you, at the event next Tuesday, you would presumably welcome building those relationships with producers directly to essentially help potential partnerships further on down the line. Absolutely. So, you know, we have done some projects where we've brought brands on board with programs. Most of the programs we invest in don't have brands involved at all so they're just straight up investments but there are some projects where for example we're looking for one of our publicist clients in our group to get involved with a project so a bit like ad funded programming or branded entertainment so sometimes there are ideas which are really attractive to brands and and quite at the moment there's a lot of brand interest in programming that's more centered around purpose and sort of having a meaningful outlook and rather than you know actually advertising their brand in a straightforward way so what I mean is that mental health or gender diversity might be a really important priority for a brand rather than necessarily doing a demonstration of a food product in a program so that's becoming really important to brands and we're finding that if we can find projects that are centered around these important issues, then we can help get brands on board. So an example of that is we did one last year with a program on Sky called Big Boys Don't Cry, which was a documentary feature made by Ridley Scott's Associates. So fantastic producers. And they made a program which featured Joe Marler, the international rugby player, who has talked a lot about his issues around uh, mental health. He had a breakdown a few years back and it, he had to leave rugby and he really wants to talk about uh, about that impact and, and what other people are doing around it. So we made the investment into that program and supported it with Sky. And what we did with that particular one is we actually got um, one of our brands on board from the publicist stable, which was Royal London. And they became a partner in that because they already had a relationship with rugby and, and it was a really important subject for them. So sometimes we can have you know, partners coming into these projects as well on, on these type of initiatives. And similarly, we had one in the U.S., on Crackle Plus, uh, which was a program centered around uh, people of color. And we brought on a brand within the publicist group in the American market called The General. So we, we sometimes do have, you know, projects that have brands involved, um, get brands involved as well. So yeah, so the, the, those are definitely types of projects that, that we can do. Oh, it's, it's a great position to be in, Katie, to have all of those amazing brands that publicists represent, but also your relationships with broadcasters as well, which is a really interesting positioning, you know, to be right in the center of that. I'm imagining that we're going to be seeing a little bit more of that work directly with your brands going forward. Do you, do you expect to see that? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, um, it's certainly um, in the US, we've got more of this going on. We've got a, an inclusion and diversity fund, which is a huge uh, $25 million fund that's been set up to support 
programming and companies that are um, centered around diversity. And in fact, this whole area is really important to Apex Content Ventures in that although we do diverse range of programming, we're looking more and more to programming which supports um, diversity and inclusion. That's an important mission statement for our company. We've set up a fund specifically to do that in the US, and that does have quite a lot of brand involvement as well. Um, We will do lots and lots of projects that don't have brands involved. We make investments straight to the broadcasters and we will do some projects that might have brands involved. So there's going to be a variety of different ones that come through. Well, speaking about brand funded programming and brand funded content, you're obviously taking part in the brand funded programming 2.0 panel which is <laughs> happening at uh, the telecast uh, content funding festival and the other panelists is going to be moderated by claire thompson from k7 media who's obviously produced some great work in the past in this area but we've also got bav chandrani from itv and also simon wells yeah. former controller of uh, branded entertainment at channel four so it's a fantastic panel that some real expertise there and maybe we might we might get to hear a little bit about what itv are doing in the space because you mentioned channel four is uh have been really been the leaders when it comes to the uk market they seem to have really been the leaders in mm-hmm. in branded entertainment and be interesting to get simon's uh insight into that but be also interesting to hear about what itv are planning it sounds like they're dipping their toes in the water in this area and maybe what the future looks like for them. Absolutely. I, I think that the that I think there's a lot of change coming. Channel 4 have done a lot of projects around ad funded and, and it's worked very successfully for them. And I know that ITV have done quite a few things. I also used to work at Sky and I myself have done a few projects that were funded by brands or part funded by brands or brands involved. So there's a whole diversity of knowledge and experience that are coming to the panel, which should be really interesting for people to hear about some of the challenges and opportunities that are available to various producers and you know how they can get different investment models. I'm really looking forward to this panel in particular because I think it's, it's just, there's just so much knowledge on this panel and and we've got an hour to get into the uh, the detail of some of these aspects in brand funded programming. For the meantime, Casey, thank you so much for coming on Telecast. Really lovely to chat with you and hear about Apex Content Ventures because I've never been quite sure where the business sits. I'm really clear on that now and look forward to seeing you next Tuesday on the panel. And obviously, you're going to be around for some of the day anyway for uh, independent producers to come and chat to and, and network with at the event. Absolutely. Yeah, I will be around for some of the day and I'm really looking forward to it as well. Meeting up with lots of different producers would be great. Okay, Casey, thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Thank you for having me. So my next guest on this week's show is Gerrit Kemming. Delighted to welcome Gerrit from Quintus Studios back on the show again. How are you doing, Gerrit? How are you? I am very well. Actually, you just catch me coming back from Easter holiday, so I am uh, very well. Thanks for having me in the show again, Justin. Not at all, not at all. It was lovely also to see you on the Quasset at uh, MIP TV. You seem to be pretty busy. How was the uh, market for you? pretty busy though uh, the palais itself looked quite deserted but on the crozette and actually outside and actually meeting wise and and discussion wise and it was it was a really interesting market i would say a really interesting day so it was very busy and actually i would say as far as you can say uh, only a couple of days after a uh, very successful one for us good now obviously you were showcasing your very different funding model and rolling that out to producers out in Cannes. And obviously that's something that you're going to be doing at the Telecast event next week, and you're going to be on the co-production panel. We've talked about this briefly on the show before, but so just as a bit of a reminder, can you give me an idea of how your model works? Because obviously Quintus Studios is a channel owner, as well as being a distribution business. And so you have a suite of successful AVOD channels. Just to give us a bit of an insight into that new model and how that's working so far. Yeah. Um, so what, what we are offering is actually uh, the two, I would say, powers, one from, from the distribution, global distribution side, 
the other one from uh, from being a uh, broadcaster, as you said, it's an it's an AVOD broadcaster. So we're not talking about a you know pay TV network such as such as Discovery, but it is significant money and and revenues that AVOD channels, as we all know, are uh, able to generate. Meanwhile, and what we're offering is to bring both of these powers and potentials on the table, and then offer to pre-sale partners, such as usual broadcasting partners, and uh, the producer itself to get into a co-production with us. Because I think the beauty of this is that we can guarantee revenues and airtime in every single territory of this planet. And in each single territory, we can always leverage or actually decide if we want to go with our own channels and the potential outcome or uh, uh, revenues that we generate on our own channels, or if we want to go with a potential broadcasting partner that might bring more for this project to the table. So we can always, in each territory, can decide do we want to go either this way or that way. And I think that is the, the very interesting thing about our model. There is the flexibility of actually identifying a project and then looking, saying, okay, this is going to work from an AD, AVOD perspective. We know that our audiences are going to like this sort of content but also let's not throw away the traditional linear broadcasting model which is you know still king to a certain extent do you think that this sort of hybrid model is the way things are going to develop now i mean obviously you're going to say yes because it's uh... <laughs> yes and i think it's the only way <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean I, I think it's it's at least one way to be totally honest honest it's it's not totally new way right? i mean discovery they also had or have channels in in uh each territory of this this planet and they have their their own distribution still i mean we are in a need to be way more flexible i guess uh, in terms of partnerships that we can close in 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 different um territories but i would say it it is at least one way to uh circumnavigate the the problem that all of us having in in this world of production or producing and co-producing so the problem with the budget getting lower and lower from the potential that the legacy uh, broadcasting partners and the decision process is taking longer and longer and we can just say look we like this just as you said we like this this program or this pitch very much from producer a because we know from our you know, 1 billion data sets per year, we know that this will work on our channels, but we also know from 15 years of being in, in the distribution business that this will sell around the world once both those boxes are ticked and the producer is flexible enough in adjusting to our model in terms of how he calculates the budget and so on and so on then we can straight away say yes let's go and the decision is you know can be done within an hour a day or a week or whatever right so it's it's very quick that's really what you've been focusing on with your co-pro club that's the basis of that so this is it sort of feeds into your model doesn't it the uh, the co-pro club you obviously launched that a couple of months ago yeah how's that going well we just did it one first time, which was at the end of, of March, well, it already uh, seems to be quite a while ago, but it's only only a month, not even. <laughs> um, anyway, so the Corporal Club, yeah, it absolutely feeds into this. So what we realized from our, from our distribution business already is we need to have partnerships. It's always better to have partnerships because you can get more money for a project, uh, making the project better. The, the problem for us, you know, taking us aside as a co-pro partner, but just the pre-sale partnering financing model was always the, the long decision-making processes, as I mentioned before. But what we realized was even back then, even before COVID, if we ever have a, have a, a project and bring partners, not only the producer and one of the pre-sale partners, but bring more of the pre-sale partners, so broadcasters to one table, the decision process might speed up a lot by this and so what we did was we now develop a uh, internet platform where we invite pre-selected potential partners as well as projects and producers all of which have in common that they would be potential interesting 
uh, projects for our own channels and where we see potential in a ready-made sales later on. And what we now do is bring us into a room, bring the producer into a room and invite the pre-selected partners like broadcasting partners where we know they they have a tendency to you know to be interested in such a show invite them to one table and then you know, let's say one video call and uh, and then have a discussion together with all of them and that is the, that is a cobra club that we that we have built then and presumably you're going to be looking to meet with producers at the telecast event next week to become part of this uh, co-pro club when you next run it and, and is that right and when are you looking to run the next co-pro club well, absolutely. We're always looking for more producing partners and for flexible new potential partnerships. So because the the ideas and the producers are always the most important part in this in this whole game. And the next Cobra Club is not yet 100% set. It depends on the projects and pitches that we, we get pitched uh, over the next weeks. But it's going to be early summer, so probably in about six to eight weeks that we make the next Cobra Club. So we are very much looking forward to to new partnerships with producers, to new ideas that could be um, could be a good fit for the Cobra Club. The model that you have, Garrett, do you see it as being a new model that perhaps wouldn't have worked pre-pandemic? You know, the the huge change that we saw in SVOD and AVOD over the pandemic and now we're, we're, we're accelerating out of it again finally do you think the new landscape now opens up very different types of opportunities that perhaps existed two years ago I, i'm not so sure if covid was really i mean it was a catalyst if you say so i think you say so so uh, but this would probably would have happened without covid anyway it might have taken longer that way, but I think it's just a question of AVO channels being grown up meanwhile, or at least some of them, or some, let's say, some owners and operators of such networks as we are, they are meanwhile grown up to be able to step with significant money to step into a project and fund it that way, right? That would have been, at least for us, would not have been possible two, three years ago, and COVID was definitely a pusher for us or booster. But I think we would have gone the same way anyway. It would have maybe taken longer, a year or so. So to answer your question, yes, two or three years ago, that would not have been possible. But is COVID the reason for this? Yes and no, because it's a booster. But I think that the development would have gone the same way anyway. We've seen AVOD you know, increasing. We've seen lots of data on AVOD take up again over the last uh, year or so. And Omdia did a research a few months ago, which was uh, which is a really good piece of work in showing that growth curve that AVOD is enjoying and, and what it's projected to do. We saw this week Netflix losing subscribers for the first time and their share price cratering. And there's also word of Netflix now thinking that They'll be advertising on the service in a couple of years' time or so. It feels that we've almost reached peak SVOD. Is that what you think? And obviously, there's a huge opportunity now with interest rates and cost of living shooting up. Finally, you know, AVOD is is really going to pick up even faster than it's been growing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you, you say it, right? Everything is getting especially now more and more expensive so so it's just natural that everyone's looking after after their pennies right and they uh, there there's just a certain amount per per household that you know they want to spend on entertainment and once that is reached then there is no more money to be spent on any asphalt so i think for an operator you need to be sure about or you need to know what kind of content you have and if it's like very very niche and only accessible in your channel then as what might still be the way to go if it's the big brands fiction and the big series then it's still definitely the way to go but if it's you know everything else or anything outside of that like the content that we have which is like really high profile documentary content but is it unique enough 
is it niche enough for the ordinary person to pay extra on it, even or especially if, if they are tied on, on the pocket? Or is that something that he he wants to come across somewhere, maybe on YouTube or on Snap or on, on Facebook or, or, or on fast channels or whatever? And then the way to go is definitely the Avo model, I guess. Search is going to play a big part in this, isn't it? Content discovery and search is going to be absolutely key. Not that it isn't now, but be even more important in the in the months and years ahead. I mean, especially for us, you know, being big on, on YouTube and YouTube being the, the second biggest search engine uh, on this planet, we, we know how important search can actually be. And I think that, that is something probably where, for example, fast they still have work to do in terms of how how a potential person might find really their channels that they are interested in. Whereas on YouTube, I think the, the search engine is very well de- developed. And if you know how that works, you can even uh, produce or plan your programming according to this, which is then again helpful for the platform, for the audience, but also for us, obviously. So yes, search is a, is a very, very important point. Developing content to sit within the search uh, algorithm, which is uh, fascinating stuff. So, Garrett, turning to next week and the panel that you're kindly sponsoring and uh, sitting on alongside Richard Tulkart from Buccaneer Media, Lilla Hurst from Drive, and moderated by Amanda Groom, you're going to be talking about co-production evolved and where we'll go from here. Because, you know, it seems to me that there are very many ways to embark upon co-productions where do we see it going do you think i mean i mean obviously that's a very big question and maybe one for for the panel itself but as we're seeing budgets shrinking but there's actually more and more buyers we're seeing these partnerships being absolutely key aren't we and and that's that's only going to presumably increase in importance for producers you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the pure model of co-producing, putting two, three high budgets together, they they will still exist, right? They will also exist in the future in five years' time because uh, there is ZTF and BBC and NHK, they, they will obviously continue to, to exist. And there is a reason for this because the audience wants this very, very high-profile blue chip documentary documentary series and and that it's good that they go on and exist even in the future what will change a lot is that the pre-sale model from from five six seven years ago where you know where we had five six territories on the planet that had two or three partners each that would be able to step into a a pre-sale to fund a production which has now shrink to, let's say, four or five territories with one broadcast potential preset partner each. So this, uh, this shrunk, plus, as I said before, the, the decision process got longer. What that means is there will be less money up front. But the good thing is, with all this VOD stuff, is that the shelf life, that is at least my view, the shelf life of a project is way, way longer because whereas like five years ago, after three years running time on a potential broadcaster, the the buyer from this channel had to decide, do I want to continue and relicense this title or do I take the competing title, which is a new title? And once, so it was a completely hit or miss thing. Hmm. Now on VOD, at least on our channels and on fast channels, the older titles sit alongside the newer ones and they continue to make money what that means is yes there might be less money up front for such projects but in the longer term there is probably more money to be made so that means we as as a distributor we as as a channel owner but also the producer might need to be more flexible in terms of how and when we actually get the revenues or the money for a certain for, for a specific production So I think, and that is something that is probably difficult for a market, the the producer market, who is used to getting the money up front. 
now you know adjusting to this new way of generating money with a production so that is probably something that will take a while but i think this is at least one way how how the whole area of productions and co-productions will change over the future mm, that's really interesting you could see producers bigger producers or even smaller ones actually adopting a bit of a portfolio approach where you know to get their shows into production obviously they may want to take the uh, certain type of more traditional deals but also those shows that they're perhaps not getting the initial bites on they'll take a different view and say okay maybe this is more of a, a long tail content project that we can embark upon and we can get started yeah. working on now that, that is actually part of our model and that's the approach that we promote heavily that we say, guys, and I mean the producer, guys, let's not think about how we can as much money as possible now as we haven't even produced it, but let's try to get this off the ground somehow by trying to see what is the real hard cost and that should be covered because the producer shouldn't really go into higher risk. But maybe there is some fees or at least the, the markup or the, the the profit that can be deferred to later. And by that, we get this project over the line. And then there is something that we can make money with. If it's the right project, which can be not proved or not guaranteed. So we have with our data and with our experience from, from distribution, we have a very strong forecast for the, the potential of a, of a certain project. And that can be a lot more interesting than getting as much money now up front. Garrett, fascinating. Well, we look forward to hearing more from you on this next week. And and obviously, you're basically dealing in factual content, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, purely, yeah. Purely factual, yeah. Right. on the same panel, we've got Richard Tilkart, who's also going to be talking about this from a, a drama perspective so that that's going to be uh interesting to hear it's going to be exciting yeah yeah safe trip from berlin garrett we'll see you next week in london thank you yeah we'll speak to you soon thank you very much and i'm very much looking forward to our seeing you on the one end uh, again next week and seeing hopefully a lot, a lot of other very very interesting delegates at this nice venue <laughs> My final guest on this week's show is Rob McRae, Managing Director at New World Film Finance. Welcome to Telecast, Rob. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And you're a, another guest on this week's show who's uh, going to be a, a panellist on Tuesday's event. For those who don't know you or your business, can you tell us a little bit about New World Film Finance? Yeah, of course, um, Justin. So uh, it's still a very new company. We're in our very early stages. Essentially, my background was in the sector, in the entertainment sector. And then I worked outside of that sector for many years. Doing that, I created a really interesting network of people. When I came back into the sector again, one of the particularly successful guys that I used to work with was very interested in developing some work within the television and cinema space. So we started working together on creating a funding model that would attract funders into the sector that traditionally would avoid it, considering it too high risk. And so that was the essentially the birth of New World Film Finance. And then in terms of what we offer, you know, it's interesting because we have a an online presence now and um and a small presence on social media, we do get contacted a lot by production companies looking for gap finance or looking for seed funding. And that isn't what we do. Essentially, the space that we operate in is completion funding or total project funding. That's where we, we like to work. That's where our funders are interested in being. The company name suggests you only work in film, but do you also work in, in TV investment? Uh, we principally work with TV investment. So the film, I suppose, is a little bit um, misleading, but it's sort of harking back to the time when everything was on film rather than digital. But yeah, we're predominantly in the TV space. We will do some cinema, um, but with cinema, I mean, we look at everything very carefully, but with cinema at the moment, we look at it particularly carefully because it didn't fare so well during the pandemic. I think sort of very particular films seem to be doing well at the moment. Uh, I'm thinking about on the streaming platforms, 
films which well which actually which is actually re- reflected in the oscars with the steam streaming platforms where they're sort of producing high high end television films it seems to be a really interesting space and over the last couple of weeks i've actually had an opportunity to watch a lot of stuff because my family have been abroad which gave me a lot of film watching time and i've been really impressed with a lot of the work that's coming film work that's coming cinema work that's coming through the streaming platforms at the moment very very high quality exciting times well it certainly is it's certainly a boom for the whole sector really and obviously that gives you an opportunity i'm sure that you're keen to take can you tell us a little bit about you mentioned earlier on about completion now i'm a bit of a finance novice when it comes to yeah. i mean i understand gap financing and what yeah. that is so you you said either whole project which again yeah. is straightforward but what does completion financing mean so completion financing is um is a term which is used when you will cover you don't want to confuse it with only funding post production completion funding is when you will fund the project from beginning to end to its final completion but it will also relate to partial finance if you've been involved in funding the project from the beginning, but maybe you're only funding, I don't know, 45% of it or 55% of it. If you're there from the beginning until the end, it's completion funding. So in terms of New World Film Finance and the way that you operate, I mean, do you operate particularly differently to other financiers in the sector? What's different about uh, what you offer? So in terms of what we offer to production companies, it's there's sort of very little difference, you know, compared to other film funding companies or some banks that will get involved up to 50% of the budget. Where we're different is that the safety mechanisms that we're building and the process that we've put in place enables funders that wouldn't normally be attracted to this sector to come into this sector and feel that they can fund it as safely as if they were funding a property development project or um, you know, a tech startup or a company startup style investment. So it's about getting the right financial instruments and tools in place to attract many more funders to the sector than have been operating within the sector historically. And that's really important at the moment because you know, you know and I know that this is um, an industry which is really growing. And when an industry is growing, it needs to be able to attract new funding in order for that growth to be sustainable. Absolutely. And and it's interesting what you mentioned earlier on about investors previously may not have been as disposed to you know investing into content a few years ago, whereas now mm. you're providing a much more safe environment presumably yes. for for them to come in and and risk their investment essentially yeah and i have to say we're not alone in that there are other companies that are moving in that direction as well which is which is i think really important because when we're working with production companies and broadcasters it's really good if it's sort of happening as a general movement within the sector rather than just us trying to force it through Uh, because it means that there's a greater understanding of what investors and funders in television and film production need in order for them to, you know, feel that they can invest huge amounts of their money into the sector, because it's an expensive sector. It's one of the more expensive sectors, you know, for 14 million pounds, you could, you know, build quite a large um, property development. But in our sector, 14 million pounds will probably give you a series and a half. So yes. yeah, if that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's, yeah. that's true. Never th- thought of it like that. Mm. But you're absolutely right. Mm. Presumably, you're mainly involved in scripted projects. Is that right? TV scripted projects for streamers? Or do you look at unscripted as well? We've got a couple of unscripted in our portfolio i tell you for me the bottom line is it's got to be good you know it's it's got to be good so scripted or um, factual you know as long as it's good as long as there's something in there that really pulls you in then we'll then we'll look at it you know one of the things that i'll be talking about next week is this sort of list of requirements from the production company and the broadcaster that we need in order for these sort of non-traditional sector funders to be able to operate in the sector 
which is also part of it. So scripted or factual comes into it a little bit, but what comes into it more is whether or not the production company can meet the investor's requirements. Oh, well, that's going to be really interesting to hear that because this is a whole, forgive the pun, a new world for yes. many producers. Go. That's the name. Yeah. 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 And so to understand, you know, what those requirements are, and this is actually quite similar in a way to what we were talking about around brand funded programming. There's, you know, there's yeah. brands have got particular requirements and there's always a bit of a toing and froing of what can be delivered in a project that's going to be broadcastable yes. uh, and suitable for a broadcast as well. So that's interesting. I mean, yeah. what do you look for in an investment then in general? I mean, that's a very wide question, I realize. But what is it you said that earlier on that, you know, as long as it's good, but yeah. what do you look for uh, when you're investing in a project? On the creative front, who's involved? What's their track record is important. If it's a newer artist, then the idea has to be really grabbing if you know if it's an artist with more experience then obviously that mit- mitigates the risk significantly so we look at track record of who's behind the camera and who's in front of the camera we also look at what kind of wider structure the production company has to make sure that they can support the project and we you know like to see what what other things they've done in the past so at the moment we're working with Jenny Penrose who is from Extras and Absolutely Fabulous, French and Saunders, that stable. And Ben Kellett, who directs Death in Paradise and Mrs. Brown's Boys, Kate and Koji, amongst others. So sort of between the two of them, you've got 60 years of high quality product in British television. So you know that that's a safe pair of hands. That's important. I'll tell you where we can help production companies. If they do come to us early on in the project then we can point them in the right direction to get the things in place that they would need to get in place if they wanted to work with us as funders. We don't just sort of close the door and say, you know, come back when you're ready. We will tell them exactly what's needed because some of it is very similar to what producers are already used to having to create. But there are a couple of little differences in there that need to go into the deck that would um, be important for an investor who is traditionally from tech startup to do his first project in this sector there are a couple of things that would need to be in that pitch uh, that wouldn't necessarily be there if you were pitching to a traditional entertainment sector funder when it comes to the producers that are going to be at the content funding festival next tuesday what sort of producers would you be looking to to meet up with ideally and and to connect with Uh, again presumably ideally ones with a track record who've got a project at a very early stage yeah a track record you know a track record project at a very early stage where other funders aren't involved yet because that's the other bit around completion funding so we will fund in partnership with other organizations but often in this sector i'm sure you know this uh, you know because it's been done for so long the sort of piecemeal approach to funding is very common And the sector has sort of demanded that of producers in the past. But our funders, they don't operate like that. You know, they're they're interested in, you know, either 100% fund or if broadcasters are involved. This was part of the learning curve for us. But our our funders are happy to share investment with broadcasters. So, for example, you know, let's say Channel 4 wanted to commission something and they also wanted some skin in the game our funders would be comfortable with them putting down 25% of the budget. And then obviously agreements would need to be negotiated around that. But yeah, I mentioned that in terms of the, the, you know, you're saying what kind of producers. So I think producers with well-formulated projects that are early in the process are very interesting for us. Newer creative teams that have a you know, really exciting idea because then just on a personal level, I'm really interested in working with them and I'll help them get all the other stuff in place um, if they're really exciting and, you know, they get my heart beating a bit for the project. Kind of that's where the good bit comes in. It's quite difficult to define, isn't it? But, you know, there there will be newer artists and producers coming through with excellent stuff that shouldn't be shut out of the game just because they're new. It's a little bit idealistic, but we kind of notoriously run a very closed business. But the industry is growing and we need to find the mechanism to get these people through effectively and doing really good work off the bat. Well, 
Robert, I'm really looking forward to to hearing your panel, and you're going to be appearing alongside Wayne Mark Godfrey from Pipe, who are also sponsoring the panel, Eric Collins from Impact X Capital, and Amanda Groom from The Bridge, who's going to be moderating the panel as she does so effectively. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to your session and meeting you in person in London. Me too. I think it's going to be great. Thanks, Robert. All the best. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Well, that's about it for this week's show. I hope you enjoy. And we hope to see you at the Telecast Content Funding Festival, our new industry event created to bring content producers and financiers together to explore the wide range of production funding options available today. With delegates and panellists already confirmed from Channel 4, ITV, BBC Studios and leading indies, it takes place at Lincoln's Inn in London on Tuesday, April 26th. Tickets are strictly limited and on sale now at telecast.com forward slash events. We hope to see you there. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next week's show, as always, stay safe. Pipe is the world's first trading platform for reoccurring revenues. It lets you turn your long-dated entertainment receivables into upfront capital so you don't have to wait years for payments. Pipe can help you pull forward up to five years worth of contracted license fees from all the major streamers and broadcasters. So you can use the capital to produce more, acquire more, finance more and grow your business on your own terms. Sign up today at pipe.com slash entertainment. That's pipe.com slash entertainment. And start fast forwarding your receivables now.